I mean, and your experiments are all require people there. Yeah, they all require that. people. So we're doing online stuff, which is not the same. <laughs> it's interesting. Oh, we're streaming on YouTube. Okay. I'll be really on God. I okay. know. <laughs> <laughs> it's better to put these things out of one's mind. I yeah. Okay. <sighs> It's funny because it feels different, like stream is streaming than non-streaming. But <clears throat> since we post it on YouTube, anyways, uh, uh, like before we even streamed, we always record it and posted it on YouTube. But even though it feels different, we it always ends up on YouTube. Um, so the end result is the same, but some somehow having it live feels different uh, when you're speaking. Yeah, much more stressful. We could always we could always like edit it afterwards. Otherwise, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> I always console myself by imagining that no one will want to watch it. That's right. That's right. <laughs> you look at most of them, they got eight views. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. uh, I guess Farhan has told you that our normal starting time is five. Yeah, right. that's, yeah. that's everywhere yeah, in the world. It's, 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 it's fine. Mm. Good deal. Hey, Dan. This is Sigo. Oh, how you go? How are you? Good, good. good. good so you. great to see you. And thanks yeah. for, for so volunteering for uh, IEEE BioRob. Oh, we yeah. appreciate very much. Yeah. yeah I yeah. probably should talk with Ferran and to mention that this would uh, be a free access for people in robotics. It's a right. conference. Uh, uh, 29 November to December 1st. Um, and we will have this as a free access, uh, this IEEE conference, and Daniel is our keynote speaker. What's you the may, topic you, of the conference? It's uh, robotics uh, applied by robots, so robots that take inspiration on uh, biology. I see. So, Primarily rehab robotics, surgical robotics, and uh, um, and uh, some basic ideas of control. We put I put an announcement on uh, the robotics mailing list, so uh, maybe I should uh, uh, remind people because was we'll sent a couple, maybe two weeks ago. So Suniwa Grawal from Colombia is the chair, and I'm the co-chair of the conference. Ah, good. So it's free access. So uh, would be anybody can participate and uh, and hear the talks. Interesting. Yeah, I've never had a chance to. I've never said we. I will run this experiment. I've always tried to get numbers. Hey, but, you know, uh, are you in the right call? <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah, I lost the contact. The cont yeah, I don't know who said that, but also it was unclear too. Uh, but anyway, I'll uh, shut my video and get mute. Uh, good to see you, Daniel. Good to see you. Good. <sighs> We will start in a couple of minutes. So we are waiting for uh, a bit. Uh, people will still show up at, until I'm eighty ten.
I think it's now five minutes past the hour, so let's start now. Welcome to the uh, seminar. Today we have Daniel Warper with us. Uh, he read medicine at Cambridge before completing a PhD in physiology at Oxford, and then a postdoc at, at MIT uh, with us. He then joined the faculty at the Institute of Neurology at UCL in 1995, and then moved to Cambridge in 2005, where he was a professor of engineering and also a Royal, Royal Society research professor. In 2018, uh, then he joined the Zucker Mind Mind Brain Behavior at Columbia as a professor in neuroscience. He has been elected uh, as a fellow of the Royal Society and has been awarded the Royal Society Francis Crick Prize, the Minerva Foundation Golden Brain Award, and the Royal Society for Euro Medal. He, uh, his uh, research is probably very different from most of our work, but at the same time, super relevant because he studies um, the computational principles underlying uh, sensory motor learning. Uh, welcome to the seminar. Thank you so thank you so much. It's really a great pleasure to be here. Um, I've given a few of these online talks. It's a little painful um, compared to being there in person. Um, since some of the work I'll talk about is probably quite far from your areas, I'd be really happy to have questions of clarification, interruptions, discussion as we go through. It's sort of slightly painful to talk to a screen for 40 minutes, but um, feel free to interrupt. So what we've been interested in the last few years is the issue of how do we, from our continuous stream of sensory motor experience, somehow break down the world into separate motor memories to generate a repertoire. So over our life, we experience many different tasks. And for each task, we may want to learn a separate motor memory. And one of the questions we've been addressing is what are the computational principles underneath that? So for example, as you make a cup of tea, there are several stages to this where you handle a kettle, your hands in free space, you handle a teapot and so on. So we as humans could try to you know, label these as different contexts. So we might say, for example, when the hands in free space, these green contexts are separate from the context when you're holding the kettles, these cyan ones. And similarly within these contexts, we could think that the state may change. So as you pour from a kettle, for example, the weight of the kettle will change. And similarly, as we swish around the teapot to warm it up, the dynamics change. And so, you know, we can label these ourselves, but one of the questions we want to ask is how does the brain decide to learn about how contexts work and how states change? And so what I'm going to tell you about is three things today. I'm going to first of all start with something a little, little off to the side about object representations. How do you learn what an object is in the first place? I'll then talk about rules for motor memories and central motor learning. How do you can learn multiple things? What are the rules guiding that? And for the bulk of the talk, I'll then move on to a new model we've developed, which we have not yet published, called the COIN model, standing for contextual inference. And it's a model of learning a motor repertoire, which sort of um, relies on some of the work I'll talk about in the second part. And it deals with how do you create memories, how do you express memories, and how do you update memories so you have multiple memories. And I'll describe some experimental tests of the models, both on new and existing data. And if there's time, I'll end up discussing how we can map different parts of the COIN model onto cognitive aspects of motor learning. So I'm gonna start with a very simple question. And this is a study which was rather fun because it involved working with perceptual scientists and people like me who are motor scientists. And we came together to try and understand from a perception, a motor point of view, what is an object? And of course, if you look at a dictionary definition, an object is a material thing that can be seen and touched. And if we turn that into something more neuroscience-y sounding, it's a consistent sense of sensory properties and physical affordances. So I think we'd all agree this is an object. We might agree this is an object. We might say this is two objects. Um, so visually, we can sort of look at things and decide, you know, as adults, what's an object and what's not. And more than that, we'd have some feeling of the haptic attributes for the objects. What it would we like to interact with them? How hard it would be to break this object into two compared to this object into two or to separate these two objects? So to be an object, somehow you have to link the visual attributes to the haptic attributes. And the question we really want to ask here is how do we extract object representations in the first place um, from a scene such as this? And there are theories out there which say that, you know, we might use specialized cues. For example, you can use edges, boundaries, occlusions, and so on to extract what are objects from visual information. But the hypothesis we want to test is to su suggest that maybe these specialized cues are just examples of a more general principle that leads to object re representations. That's consistent statistical properties, whether they be visual or haptic. And so what we're going to do is create visual haptic objects defined solely by statistics with no specialized cues and ask, can you learn what an object is within the modality? And more often, would it immediately generalize to the other modality? So 
to give you a feel of what we've done, I'm going to make you be a subject now and tell you what you would experience as a participant in our experiment. And after explaining that to you, I'll explain to you what the idea behind the experiment is. So we sit you at a sort of little virtual reality table where you see in your work, reaching workspace, these images. And we say, pay attention. And we show you 444 of these images every couple of seconds like this, and you just have to watch them. And you're told that we may ask you questions about these images later on. And as you can see, it's a, it's a gray square, and there's always six symbols displayed at different places and different symbols. Okay, so you pay attention to that, and we show you 444 of those. And having done that, we ask you a couple of questions at the end. We now show you a pair of symbols, like first, and then another pair of symbols, and say, which feels more familiar to you? So it will give me a false choice judgment of familiarity, okay, between which of those two pairs looks more familiar. And then we do a pulling test. We give people a picture of a two by two grid of symbols on gray with little virtual clamps. They're told this object's being clamped by these clamps, so you can't break it apart. But we give you a couple of robots you can act on. And you're gonna pull on those robots, which, is, which simulates a stiff spring, so you feel the force as you pull on it, and you're asked to pull with a force you think would just break the object apart. And you do that both horizontally and in a vertical direction. And we train you beforehand how objects break apart. If you pull horizontally, they break down this tear line. If you pull vertically, they break down this tear line. And more than that, we pre-train you before the experiment on clearly segmented objects. So we show you clearly segmented objects like this. And in this case, if you pull horizontally, it breaks with a low force. Whereas you pull vertically because you're breaking two objects apart, it breaks with a high force. Okay, so that's the idea. So unknown to the subject, the way this inventory, this, the way these images or scenes are created is from six true objects, which we call true pairs. And why we call them an object is because this symbol is always on the right of this symbol, and this symbol is always below this symbol. So when we construct the objects, we don't show you the colors, we construct them by tiling these true pairs in all possible configurations, pretty much, okay? And so the important thing here is the specialized cues, which are boundaries and edges, are totally irrelevant. The objects are not the symbols themselves. The objects are defined only by the statistical contingency. So by experiencing all these scenes, one could extract what are the elements based on which these um, scenes are built up. So when we go to the familiarity task, what we do is we present you with one true object or true pair and one chimera which has a symbol taken from two different um, true pairs and the idea about the familiarity is that you know in general in life things which have normal statistics such as this brush are more familiar than chimeras so we expect you to be more familiar with this object than you would which is a chimera of two objects and in fact, when I was looking for examples of Chimera, I was very pleased to come across actually a very famous Chimera, which has its own Wikipedia page, and that's the Wolpertinger. So the, Wol the Wolpertinger is a Bavarian mythical um, Chimera creature, which has got the antelopes, uh, uh, it's, it's got a bunny rabbit's head, it's got wings. And in fact, if you want to, on eBay, you can buy animal stuffed versions of this, which are created from different animals. So the idea would be you'll be more familiar with things which aren't Chimeras. When it comes to the pulling test, we give you two true pairs, but of course, you can only know how hard it'll be to pull them apart if you worked out what the pairs are. And in this case, it'll be hard to pull them apart in the horizontal direction, so you should pull harder than in the vertical direction. So this allows us to test both within modality learning in the visual domain and cross modality into the haptic domain. So we run another group of subjects in the reverse order. And this experiment is a bit more complicated. We sit subjects down at our robot and display a two by two um, a set of symbols, and we ask subjects to pull on the symbols until they break apart. So what they see is this, they start pulling, and at some point the object breaks apart. And the idea is that we see the symbol, they start ramping up the force against a very stiff spring, and at some point the object both breaks apart visually and the force goes to zero. So it's a very convincing simulation of an object pulling apart. And they do 96 of these trials pulling apart the object both horizontally and vertically. Okay. And the idea is we want them to only be able to work out what a true object is based on the forces, not based on the visual information. So in this case, we have to have true pairs. True pairs are objects which very often have this symbol on the right of this symbol, but are hard to pull apart. 
that was what makes them a true pair. They, they, they basically act like a real object, which is hard to pull apart. Pseudo pairs have the same statistics. This symbol is as often on the right of this symbol as this is on the right of this symbol, but it's easy to pull apart. So it doesn't act like a real object. And so then we make up all these objects out of either two pseudo pairs, two true pairs, a true pair and a pseudo pair, or, or possible combinations. And the idea is the force required to break them apart then depends on the configuration. So in this case, when you pull horizontally, you have to break two true pairs apart, which requires 22 and a half newtons of force. When you, for example, separate two pseudo pairs or separate two true pairs, but where you're separating the pairs, it's only seven and a half newtons. And then other configurations have intermediate forces. So importantly, there's no way based on vision alone, you can work out the difference between a true and a pseudo pair. So in fact, if anything, the fact we're using pseudo pairs acts against the object representation. And again, we go to the visual familiarity task and to the haptic potting task. And the way we score these tasks is very simple. We basically score the proportion of time subjects choose the real true pair over the chimera. And for the pulling task, we basically look at the correlation between the pulling force they generate and the force the object would have broken um, for our subjects. And if we look at within modality learning, shown here, this is for the group who got the visual exposure, they're about 75% correct on average in the familiarity, showing that they can learn object representations, as was known before from previous studies, based purely on visual statistics. In the haptic experiment, again, this is within modality learning, they show a positive correlation. So they learn the forces to pull apart when we test them at the end. Um, and if we look at cross modal learning, we can see that from visual exposure, even though they get no experience in the haptics because the objects never come part in this haptic part of the testing, we see that they show significant haptic ability to know what an object is and vice versa. Having learned the haptic, they can do the visual familiarity. Not so good at the visual familiarity, but if you remember, it's not so easy because the pseudo pairs goes against it. And in fact, the visual statistics are not completely consistent. If we look at individual subjects, there's quite a lot of heterogeneity, but the pleasing thing is that those who learn in one domain, let's say the haptic, also learn well in the visual domain, and those simply who learn in the visual domain here learn well in the haptic domain. So what it suggests to us is that multimodal object representations can arise from purely statistical learning. It doesn't mean that as children, this is what you have to rely on. Of course, specialized cues are very strong forms of statistical information, um, but it suggests to us that it's actually just statistics are enough to learn about object properties. Before I move on, are there any questions on this part? I'm happy to pause. There are three sections. So what would be the alternate hypothesis over here? Would the alternate hypothesis be that only vision or only touch is sufficient? No, one possibility is you would need both vision and touch on objects to learn about objects, or that you need specialized cues. You need very strong cues, such as occlusions, um, to learn this, that just pure statistical contingencies wouldn't be enough, that you would need those cues. Yeah. I see. Okay. Okay, so for the rest of the talk, I'm going to focus pretty much exclusively on dynamic learning of, of, of how we learn about physical properties in the world. Um, and I'm going to start off talking about rules for motor memories. Um, so to do this, we, we actually take an apparatus which was developed actually at MIT by Neville Hogan and used extensively Emilio Bizzi's group, um, which is using robotic interfaces that can generate novel um, experiences. And the reason we do this is if you want to look at de novo learning, it's important to give people an experience which they can't have seen outside the world, otherwise we might just be seeing retrieval. So we use these robotic interfaces, which in this case are a planar device, which can track the hand and generate forces at the endpoint. And we overlay that with virtual reality, very simple, and monitor a semi silvered mirror so you can have virtual targets in the plane. And so, for example, you can ask people to move holding onto it with the, the robot's robot turned off or the motor's turned off. And we're going to call that P0. It's a null field, but we're going to use these terms a lot. So P0 means moving without any perturbation. But we can also generate perturbations of the hand. And the typical one which is used is one where the forces of the hand in Cartesian coordinates relate to the uh, speed or velocity of the hand in X and Y by this matrix and a gain. And what this leads to is a, a viscous curl field. So this is the forces applied to the hand shown in blue as a function of the hand velocity. Um, and as you can see, the faster you go, the bigger the, the force. So it scales linearly with speed and it always acts at right angles to your current direction of motion. So if you make a movement, for example, along here, you'll get these red arrows of force and it'll perturb you. Okay. And so we're going to call that P plus. 
um, a force acts in one direction as P plus. If we change the sign here, we can get the opposite force to act in the opposite direction. We'll call that P minus. Um, in all our experiments, we counterbalance actually which direction is P plus and P minus. So don't worry about this left or right. They're just always in opposite directions. And finally, to test learning, we use something called channel trials. We could measure how far you deviate from a straight line, but it's hard to turn that into a number of how much you've adapted. So a nicer way which has been developed in the field is to apply a stiff spring in one dimension so that subjects are constrained to a straight line to the target. And when it, you're a subject in the experiment, it feels great for that you've done a perfect job on that trial. But what we can do is measure the forces you apply into the walls of the channel as a measure of your feed forward sort of control, what you expect the force field to be. So if the ideal force to compensate for the force field is this, and you generate something like this into the channel, your adaptation is small. But maybe later in learning, you produce something like this. And so what we look at is the slope relationship when we do regression between these two as a measure of adaptation. So we can get between zero and one, zero meaning no learning, one meaning perfect learning. So just to give you an example of a learning experiment, starting off in P0, this is now looking at the deviation from a straight line. We see nice straight lines, put the perturbation on P plus, over the course of half an hour or so, you straighten up, and then you show after effects in P0. And then what we use is these occasional channel trials. These are probe trials used maybe every 10 trials through this to measure adaptation. So this is zero, this is 100%. And as you learn, you get up to about 80% force compensation in this particular paradigm. Okay. So our interest in, in using um, this particular uh, method of learning is to ask what are the rules by which you could learn two different memories at the same time? So I can apply P plus and I can tell someone that when this light is on over here, you're going to get a force pushing you one way. And when this light is on, you're going to get the force pushing you the other way, P minus. And so what we can do is we can alternate these two trials randomly. So we randomly alternate between P plus and P minus, and subjects can know that this light is going to be predictive of which field they're going to get. And then we can measure learning. And the way we do that is with these channel trials occasionally. And if you do this effectively over the course of an hour, you get almost no learning. So people just can't use sort of a visual static cue to switch between these two force fields. Um, and this is really a minimal learning, if anything. Um, some people have shown if you do this for four or five days, you can get a tiny bit of learning, but it's really not very much. But we can change the paradigm just a little bit. And although I'm showing these in two separate panels, this movement here is the same part of space. We can ask people rather than using the static hue to start their movement from this point and do a lead in movement with no force field and then go through the force field, either coming in from the left or the right. And now the direction they come in from is predictive of the direction of the field they're going to get. So if they come in from the left, they'll get the P plus. If they come in from the right, they get the P minus. And again, we randomly interleave these. And in different groups, we can ask them to wait at this via point for different amounts of time. So if they have to wait for a second at this point, they come here, wait a second, then go through, there's no learning at all. If they only have to wait half a second, we begin to see a bit of learning. If they only have to wait 150, we see more. And if they only have to dwell for around about 50 milliseconds, we see substantial learning. So it suggests that what the hand or arm was doing in the last 500 milliseconds ago, if it's different, it allows you to separate out motor memory. So you can learn two opposing force fields, provided what you did in the last 500 milliseconds or so was different, but not if it was different a second ago. So there's a small time window of lead-in, which allows you to separate out these memories. And so we thought, well, if lead-in is important, if the past is important to separate motor memories, what about the future? And so we did a very simple experiment, which you can think of as a follow-through experiment. We had subjects now, again, with P plus and P minus interleaved. And the control group, they didn't get to follow through. There was just one of these two targets came up, which was irrelevant to their task, but it was predictive of the direction of the force field. And again, as we know, we get no learning in that situation. But now we can ask a group to follow through. They're told that they're going to make a movement and they have to make a movement to here, stop briefly and follow through either to the left or follow through to the right. And now the direction of the follow through is predictive of the field they're going to get before the follow through. And what we see in this condition is substantial learning. So if what you do after the force field, and there's no force field on this, is different, again, it allows you to separate out two motor memories. And that was sort of interesting to us because, you know, in a lot of sports, one is told follow through is really important. It's really important to follow through. Yet we know that after you've made contact with a ball or released a ball, whatever you do after that can't have any effect on the trajectory of the ball. But if what I've told you is true, 
if we think that what you do in the follow through affects the motor memory for the initial part of learning here, if you were to make a consistent follow through, it means all the learning you're going to do is going to go into sort of one motor memory. If, on the other hand, each time you do the skill, you do a different follow through, then you're going to be spreading that learning out over multiple memories if each follow through is associated with a different memory. And so we did exactly this experiment. We had one group, we did a consistent follow through. Here it's not opposing forces, just learning one simple force field, or they did a movement which had a different follow through each time. And what we found is the group who did the consistent follow through in here in red learned significantly faster. So it suggests that one reason you might want to follow through is it improves your learning of the skill you're trying to perform. You put it into one memory. And if you want to know which follow through to make, you should make the one you can make as consistent as possible, effectively. The one with least variability given, for example, motor noise. There may be other reasons for follow through, but this just might be another one, which we quite like. So it's interesting to ask, what is it about follow through? that actually allows you to separate the memory. So here is just a replication. So there's two new groups, a no follow through group and a follow through group, um, showing the same effect I've talked about before. But we can ask, is it the execution of the follow through which is important? So to ask that question, we, we have subjects who start going through the force field, but they don't know where they're gonna follow through. And halfway through the movement, the follow through target appears and they get to follow through to the left or the right, depending on the force field. So they get to execute the follow through on every movement, but they don't get to know what the follow through is before they start the movement. Um, and in this type of group, we basically encourage them, sorry, we basically test them on trials where we show them the follow through target right from the beginning. And so for, actually they could learn to backwardly associate this follow through target with the force field. But when we assess them, they show absolutely no learning at all. So we have another group who get to plan the follow through, but they never ever make the follow through in the force field. So they start off with this target, they're told they're going to make a follow through, they start the movement, halfway through the movement we turn off that target and they have to abort and end here. So they get to plan the follow through but never make it. And the way we encourage them to plan it is we have many of these trials where we don't turn off the target but they're in a channel. So they get to make the follow through but there's nothing to learn. Okay, so in these trials because they're in a, false, in, in a channel there's nothing to learn, they can only learn from these trials. And in our planning only group, we see a strong learning as actually following through. So what this suggests to us is it's not the physical state of the limb that matters at all. It's something to do with the neural planning that when you plan this, you know, this, this movement, which is gonna be a sort of a, a angle movement, you put in a different neural state. And if you plan a movement going to the other way. And so what we're thinking of really is it's the neural state that has to be different in order to allow you to associate different forces with these different states. So, what I really said is recent, past, and future um, action determine the current motor memory. We know it's the recent past. We haven't checked whether it's, it's the recent future, if that's a real word, but we're, we're pretty sure it would be. Um, and that planning is more important than execution, and probably neural state is critical rather than physical state of the limb. But I, I don't know if you go away thinking the only way you can learn multiple things is by you know, bracketing them with different movements before or after. There's also other ways you could have sort of called sensory cues, which could be useful. And one we've been particularly interested in is tool use. So if you look at all these um, birds, each one of them has an amazing tool of its own. They've all evolved a tool. And we as humans uh, are nice poachers. We have poached all these tools and more, and we can operate on all these tools and, and you know, do very well with that. And one question you can ask is when you learn a tool, do you learn it as a physicist would learn it? Do you learn F equals MA and apply that to the tool? And that might be a way you could learn about a tool. But actually, when you think about what humans do with tools, we do rather different things with different parts of the tool. So for example, when I'm drinking from the cup, the critical thing is sort of the compliant um, effect between my lips and the lip of the cup. When I'm putting the cup down, what's important is the frictional property between the base and the floor. And those are very different physics. Of course, it's all governed by the same F equals MA, but they're very different. So one question is, do you learn an object that's holistic or do you learn about the property object based on the task you're going to perform with it? And to answer that question, we did a very simple experiment where we asked people to control a tool. So what I'm showing you here is actually what subjects saw. So this is using the semi-silvered mirror in our virtual reality. So subjects can see both the virtual object, this rectangle, as well as the hand and the robot. And so this object translates with the robot. So as they move the ob 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 a robot around, this object goes with them. And on the object have different control points, different points they could choose to control on the tool, and then we can project targets. So I'm going to tell you about the control 
a, a group who do a controlled experiment. Um, and you'll know the answer to this. Each time they're asked to move the center point of the tool to a target, and we either apply a P plus field or a P minus field. And there's this an irrelevant um, sort of target on the left or the right, which tells them which field they're going to get. So well, they're moving the center, they get a left or right, which tells them and because they can't use that and they show no learning at all. But now we can do something different in another group. We can ask them now that when the left target appears here, which appeared here, to move the left control point to the target. And when the right target appears to move the right control point to the target. Now, the movements required to do this are identical to this group here. It's just a straight ahead movement. All that's changed is what we're telling them that they need to control, whether it's a left or right control point. And when we do that, we see remarkable learning. So just telling people to control different points in a tool means they can associate different motor memories to different points in a tool, as would often be the case. If you're sweeping and you're paying attention to the right part of your broom, which is going to hit the wall, it turns it one way. If it's the left part, it turns the other way. So you need to learn dynamics of tools in different ways. And just to reassure you, this has nothing to do with eye movements. We did it with fixation and without fixation. It makes no difference. Okay. So we think that control points in a tool are sort of interesting, that effectively we don't learn objects in a holistic way. We really learn them in terms of the points and the objects we might want to control. So for the last part of the talk, and in the next 20 minutes, I want to tell you about sort of a model we've been developing. And this is really the work of James Heal, who was a PhD student in my group and now is a postdoc, together with Matej Lengel, um, who's at Cambridge and uh, at CEU in Budapest. And so we call this model the contextual inference model, the COIN model. And it's COIN because it's probabilistic, as you, as you might expect. And what we're trying to emphasize here is that contextual inference is something which is sort of um, ignored in the motor learning domain and maybe an actually incredibly fundamental part. So I'm going to go through the generative model and then describe a little bit about how it works in a toy example before showing it on real data. So the idea, going back to the first slide I showed you, is that you can be in this number of discrete contexts. So here you're in a blue context, and we could transition in a Markovian way between contexts over time. So we might go to a red context and an orange context. And then each context could emit sensory cues, which could be the visual appearance of an object. And it could be a probabilistic emission of a sensory cue here at each point in time, depending on which context you're in. And more than that, each context can be associated with a state. So for example, the blue context associated with this blue state, which evolves over time as a dynamical system, the red with the red state, and the orange with the orange state. So this could be, for example, the weights of the object, which might change over time. And then the key point is you get state feedback from your movement, and that's going to depend on which context is active and the state of that context. So when the blue context is active, state feedback depends on the blue. But here, when the orange context is active, it only depends on the orange state, even though the blue and red still exist and continue to evolve. Okay. And so what we want to do in this is to do online recursive inference. Given a stream of sensory cues and state feedback, we want to estimate a large number of things in terms of both variables and parameters. So in terms of context, we want to estimate each point in time the current context probabilities, how probable I'm in context one, two, three, four, and so on. And I also want to estimate parameters. How many contexts are there? What are the context transition probabilities? And what are the Q emission probabilities? And then within a context, I want to estimate the state. I want to estimate the current state of that particular context, but also learn the parameters, the state transition dynamics within each context, which can be different. And that's a hard problem for which we use particle learning methods. So to give you a little bit more detail about what's inside the model, the context transition matrix is shown here. So here's a current, uh, current transition matrix. And the way we model this is as a sticky hierarchical Dirichlet process pair. It's sticky because we add a sort of a, a, a elements down this diagonal, because in general, you make in, in, in life, you stay in the same context for some amount of time. We use a hierarchical Dirichlet uh, process prior, um, which has um, two parameters, um, because it's non-parametric. So we don't have to specify how many contexts there are. The model complexity increases um, with data, and it's hierarchical, which has some nice properties, which are important to explain some of the data. Similarly, the Q emission matrix, given the current context, what sensory Q might I get? is also a hierarchical Dirichlet a process prior with two parameters. And again, non-parametric non and hierarchical. And the key thing is then we need to learn both of these through experience given these priors. So the states transition in the simplest way that the state of the jth context has a retention parameter, so it decays away. And also I can have a drift parameter so it can learn drift and it has noise. 
And we just place simple priors, Gaussian, a truncated Gaussian and a Gaussian prior on both the, um, uh, the retention and the drift. And so we end up with different retention and drifts for each context. And finally, state feedback is very simple. And the state feedback is just the state of the active context plus noise. So we have either seven or eight free parameters to fit the data, depending on whether we have cues or don't have cues in our experiment. And actually with seven or eight parameters, we have actually rather an expressive model in terms of um, what, what this model can do. So let me just give you an example of a toy problem so you can get a feel for the model does. So here's a toy problem. Here's state feedback, which is actually just the weight of an object, as you handle a series of cups and a, and a sugar bowl. So the cups are identical. So the sensory cue during this phase is always the same, this green cup whereas the sugar bowl looks different, so there's a different sensory cue here. Cup one is light, you then pick up cup two, which is heavier. Cup three is heavier still, and, and you maybe empty the water out of cup three, and then you go to the sugar bowl, which happens to weigh the same as cup two. So if we apply um, our model to this, what the subject, what the participant actually gets is a noisy version of this state, that's what they get, and they get the sensory cues. And based on that, they can estimate a few things in the model for doing Bayesian inference. They can estimate the probability that this is a novel context they're in. So to start off with, they instantiate a context for the blue, um, blue context, which is for cup one. When they come to cup three, they instantiate another, um, another uh, context because the novel context property is high. And in this particular setting of parameters, even though for cup two here, they did not instantiate a new context because the weight wasn't great enough, even though the sugar bowl has the same weight as cup two, you do instantiate a new context because the sensory cue was different enough. Okay, So effectively the model describes how new memories are created when novel context properties are high. Now for each how memory you-, you How yes. did you measure? How do you measure whether it was a novel context for the subject? So, so, so we have a prior for novel context, which is basically the stationary distribution um, of, of possible context. And you test whether the data is better explained by that than the current context. Okay, I can show you that better on this slide probably, on this part here. So this is the state expected for different contexts. The gray bar here is the state of the prior for novel context. And for example, initially you generate a blue context there. And what I'm showing you is the full posterior. Each slice is a posterior of the state. And as you go to this cup two, for example, you don't generate a new context, you adapt your state of that context. However, when you go to this red heavy context, rather than adapting the blue, you generate a new context, the red one here. And similarly, when you go to the orange here and the gray one then is the, the prior for novel context. And then the question is, you know, how do you decide how to use these, um, these contexts? Well, you have to estimate the predicted probability that each of those contexts is currently active. And that's shown here. So the gray is the predictive probability of a novel context. And the blue, for example, here is the predictive probability of context one. And when you go to cup three, you can see that the probability of that context, the red one increases while blue decreases. So a natural thing to do is to express each of these memories commensurate with its predictable probability. So we literally multiply this by this and sum them. And that gives you um, the, the, the basic distribution of a state shown here in the purple. And what we do then is take the mean of that as a motor output. So we can see here some interesting features that when you experience cup three, we can see sort of slow learning here of your motor output to cup three. But interestingly, with this parameter setting, it's not driven by the slow learning of the state, as often assumed in motor control. It's actually driven by slow changes in your contextual estimate. You learn the weight very quickly, you just don't express it quickly because you're not sure you're not going to stay in that novel context. And finally, learning depends on the responsibility, which is sort of the posterior. Having made the movement, you can now estimate what's my belief about what that context was. And when, for example, the red context, has high responsibility, you update it rapidly as shown here. When the red context is not thought to be active, it diffuses out according to its linear dynamics. Okay, so the critical thing here is that this model sort of unifies memory creation, memory expression, and memory updating, all required as part of contextual inference. And so what I'm gonna do now is show you some data sets and talk about how this can explain it compared to other models. So there's a, a quite a famous paper in our field and probably none of you have heard of it called um, on spontaneous recovery from 2006. And spontaneous recovery has been around but not in the motor domain until this paper. And so the paradigm to get spontaneous recovery is as follows. You give subjects P0 and null field, 
followed by P plus field in one direction. And then you rapidly adapt them with just a short burst of P minus with the aim of bringing them back to de-adaptation. And then you put them into a long series of channel trials, okay, to, to measure the expression of learning with no more, more learning. And when you do that, you intermingle this with a few channel trials. So you can see no learning, then you learn the P plus. We don't apply channel trials during the P minus, so you don't see any data there. But at the end of P minus for this particular group, they're actually below zero. And you go into the channel trials, but interestingly, rather than just decaying back to zero, they show spontaneous recovery, a transient re-expression of P plus, which then begins to decay away. Okay, so which is strange because you know, in general, if the state was here, you normally tend to think this thing things just de-adapt away. And the way this spontaneous recovery or re-expression of the P plus is explained or has been explained is with what's called a dual rate model, which was proposed in this paper, which has become a very popular model. The idea is that you use performance error, the difference between, for example, the perturbation and your output, to drive learning in two competitive processes. You have a fast learner and a slow learner. So the fast learner has a state which decays quickly, so alpha is small, but it learns quickly, so beta is big. Okay, So it's a fast learner and a fast forgetter. And you have a slow learner which learns slowly and forgets slowly. Okay, And they add together equally to combine to the motor output, so they compete. So the total output of this model shows the following. It learns, it de-adapts, and it shows the spontaneous recovery. And the reason it does that is if we look at the fast and slow components, the fast component starts learning, but as the slow one learns and takes over, the fast goes down. When you de-adapt, it's mainly done by the fast learner. So when you're fully de-adapted here, or if you have no adaptation, it's because the slow learner is positive and the fast learner The fast learner is equally negative, so they're equal and opposite. So when you go into the channel trial phase, there's no longer any errors. You make lovely straight line movements. So all you use decay according to these alphas. So the slow learner decays slowly, the fast decays quickly, therefore it basically re-express the slow learner, which then decays away. Okay, so that's a standard explanation of spontaneous recovery. But we can run our model, the coin model, on the same paradigm. So we can run this paradigm. And what we get is spontaneous recovery. We see it here, decrease, and we see this spontaneous recovery. But we get it for a very different reason. We get it because when you experience P plus, you generate a new memory for P plus. When you experience P minus, you generate a new memory for P minus, shown here. This is a state. But when you go into the channel trial phase, because P plus has been experienced for the longest, you begin to infer that you're more likely to be in P plus. So the probability of P plus increases. So it's a combination of these states decaying away and increasingly exp uh, um, uh, expressing this P plus, which leads to this spontaneous recovery. So in the coin model, we're getting changes in motor output without necessary changes in internal state through a re-expression. The idea that you can actually re-express memories to different amounts. In the dual rate model, the dynamics of the mode output is solely determined um, by, by learning. So there's no concept of time varying expression. The only way to change what you do is by adapting your internal states. And so we decided to come up with what we could think of as the smallest change to this paradigm to really distinguish between dual rate and the coin model. And so what we did is we put- Can I yes. just interrupt for, oh no, uh, for a second. Okay. Yeah. So why is I'm looking at the predicted probability when when the channel trail right there? Yep, why yep. is it so sure? Why doesn't it think that it might also be in blue mode at P0? Okay, in this particular one, P0 with the robot hasn't been experienced. P0, in, I expect in real life, is a rather special case, moving without it. Moving with the robot, for example, there are not many trials here in, this, in these trials. Okay, so there are more P plus. You normally do a few channel, few I trials see. with no perturbation. I okay, see. that's why. So one prediction is, but I, but I also think that null fields, I expect one thing will have to change the model in the future, is that there's something very special about not interacting with objects. And we haven't really incorporated that. We're treating P0 as just another thing at the moment. Okay. And so one prediction is if you did lots and lots of P0s, it might change the way you, you do your expression. Okay, so what we're going to do is give just two P plus trials early in the channel trial phase. And the idea is that in the coin model, two P plus trials is very strong evidence that the P plus context has returned. Whereas in the dual rate model, all it can do is adapt a little bit to those two T P plus. So what we predict is that rather than doing this slow change in context for the P plus, we're now gonna get a rapid change and it's gonna give us an evoked recovery, which will then decay away. Interestingly, it'll decay away to a non-zero asymptote because we've learned some drift, but that's a, a minor point. 
So here are two groups, eight subjects and a spontaneous recovery, eight and a vote recovery. You can see we get a nice spontaneous recovery in this group. And in this group, we get a lovely evoked recovery. And when we fit the dual rate model to this, it does a reasonable job on spontaneous recovery, but completely misses qualitatively on, on the evoked recovery. And the reason is to jump up from here to here requires the fast process to learn really quickly, but the fast process also has to decay very fast. Um, so that's the best it can do. When we fit the coin model to this, we can see we can explain rather nicely both this and also the time course of a vague recovery. And form a model comparison at the group level and at most of the individuals really favors the coin model um, in, in a nice way. So it suggests that, that memory creation and expression underlies sort of the spontaneous and evoked recovery, um, a, a nice support for our model. So the third part of the model was memory updating. We talked about using the posterior responsibility to update memory. So in single context models, um, Typically, you update the state based on the previous state, the error, and a Kalman gain. But when you have multiple contexts, such as our switching state space models, you update each context um, state based again on the, the Kalman gain for that and the error, but also based on the responsibility, your belief that that context was active. And therefore, even for a fixed Kalman gain here, you could get different updating dependent on your belief that context was active. So what we're going to do is an experiment. We're going to try and manipulate this responsibility and see whether we can model the updating of states. And the way we do that is we train people now where we have both sensory cues and and state feedback, which we manipulate. So we can have P plus and P minus, as we talked about before, but we associate them with two sensory cues, Q1 and Q2. And in fact, the cues we used are those control points left and right I talked about before, but that's just a, a minor detail. So people get a lot of training of doing P1 plus, P2 minus, and they can learn to produce the force, positive force when they see Q1 and the negative force for Q2. But the critical thing we want to test then is how much learning do we get to a single trial when we either give them things they've seen before, P1 plus and P2 minus, or we give them, um, uh, which are consistent with what they've learned, or we give them inconsistent things. So we give them the P plus with sensory Q2 or P minus with sensory Q1. And the way we measure that is with what's called triplets of trials. So we effectively do a channel trial before and after one of these, and we measure the change in adaptation of the channel trial, which reflects whatever they've learned here. And critically in this channel trial, we're actually gonna use Q1. So we're really asking, how much do you update the memory for one particular context, that one associated with the Q1, based on these four things? Okay. And so we run 24 subjects. It's noisy data, single trial learning. But here's the data. This shows how much adaptation you get on a single trial, um, depending on what we give here. And you can see that we get the most updating when you give P1 plus, the same Q in the same field you've learned with that Q. And for these negative forces, just to point out, this is adaptation to the negative force, but this is adaptation to the positive force. So let's see if we can understand this pattern. Effectively, what the coin model explains it by is knowing what the prior and the likelihood is for this. And so the prior is basically the information you get after just seeing the cue before you move, what you context you believe you're going to be in. And so that is very simple. Since we're going to test context one over here, the belief you're going to be in context one depends just on sensory Q. So if you show sensory Q1, you'll have a high belief of being in context one. If you show sensory Q2, you'll have a low belief. After moving, the likelihood, which is the force field, will tell you, will tell you whether you think you're going to be in context one or two. And basically, if you see the plus force field, that's the one we've associated with context one, so you should have a high likelihood. And if you see the negative force field, that has low likelihood. So just multiplying these together gives us this very nice pattern of effect. So it suggests that effectively single trial updating, even with a constant Kalman gain, um, basically uh, can take into account the Q and the likelihood in the way the coin model suggests. And in fact, we don't fit this average data, we fit each subject's entire learning um, experience to get this pattern. And just to reassure you, before any learning, there was no inherent knowledge of what Qs or contexts were. The data is flat, you learn as much in all the situations, and that's explained by a flat prior and flat likelihood. So, we can take all those subjects. That was 24 subjects, one experiment, 16 another. We have 40 subjects. We fit our model to each of them. So we're going to now take those parameters and make parameter-free predictions for previous studies. Okay. So we take the 40 parameters. We just simulate what we'd expect for the paradigm and just average the data. So there's no fitting at all going on now. So savings is a big part of motor control. If you learn something once, you go away and you come back to it, 
you learn it faster the second time. Okay, so here's a typical um, savings paradigm. It's actually spontaneous recovery done twice. You do spontaneous recovery once, and then you do it again twice. And what you find is if you look at the learning of this P plus, you're faster the second time shown here in Salmon. And if we run this on our coin model, that's exactly what we see. We see that you learn the cyan, uh, so the, 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 the second time faster. But interestingly, um, the Kalman gain is flat. It doesn't change at all. It's not the learning rate which is somehow proved you haven't sped up your learning rate and you don't learn the state any faster the second time. What's driving this again is contextual inference that having experienced P plus the first time, you're more willing to believe you're gonna be in P plus the second time and therefore the contextual inference is what's driving this faster learning, not what most people think in our field that you basically learn it faster because you have a higher Kalman gain in some sense. Similarly, anterograde interference, Antigrade inference is if you learn um, P plus for some amount of time, it's harder to learn P minus depending on how long you've learned P plus. So here you do P plus for a certain amount of time before you go to P minus. The longer you do P plus for, um, the harder it is to learn. So this curve here in cyan is slower than this blue one here. And this inset really shows this. Basically, the black is learning just P minus by itself. And as you increase P plus, you learn it slower and slower. Again, our model captures that. And again, there's nothing to do with learning rates or the rate you learn the state. It's all got to do with contextual inference. The longer you learn P plus for, the less likely you're going to believe you're going to be in a P minus state. And finally, similarly, environmental consistency. So a paper in science looked at environmental consistency and learning rates. They could put it in either very consistent environments, environments which switch very rarely, the property of staying in the same context with 0.9, or very variable environments. So you're switching here between P plus and P minus rarely, or very often or intermediate. And then what they measured is single trial learning. Having done this, how much would you learn to a single P plus trial? And the idea is when you're in a consistent environment, the single trial learning goes up. If you're in an inconsistent or variable environment, it goes down. And they argued they had a model of learning, which they said, what you do is you crank up the learning rate for consistent environments. because it makes sense to learn more because it's gonna stay around. But when we run our coin model on this, we get qualitatively the same effect. But again, the Kalman gain is completely flat. It doesn't change at all. So it's not changing the learning rate or the amount you learn. What it is, is changing your context belief about remaining in the same context. If you're in a highly stable environment, even though you learn the same amount as if in a, in a variable environment, because you believe you're going to stay in that environment for the next trial, you're going to express more of that learning. When you're in a variable environment, you don't believe you're going to stay there and therefore you express less. So again, all these are explained by contextual inference, not by change in state or learning rates. Um, do I have three more minutes to tell you about? I'll, I'll, I'll try and tell you quickly about explicit and implicit learning. So we've been interested, a lot of people have been interested recently in what you can report about what you know about motor learning. And so really this started with some work from Jordan Taylor's group where they did vision motor rotations. This is not dynamic learning now, we're switching to vision motor in which you move and effectively a cursor tracks your hand, but now it's gonna be rotated from what your hand does. So it's like a prism adaptation or rotating your mouse um, when you use your computer. So you make a movement and the cursor goes of some distance. You don't normally see your hand. Your job is to get the cursor to the target and therefore you have to learn to compensate for it. But the interesting thing they said is let's ask participants on each trial, where are you going to aim on the circle? What number are you going to aim for to try and get the cursor onto target? So the subject might say, I'm going to aim here to three. Okay. And they took that as the explicit knowledge of explicit judgment. And then they made them move and they found they didn't go to three. They actually went to seven. And so the idea is that's the implicit component. Okay? So the idea is in every trial, you can split the learning they've got into an implicit and an explicit component. And that's shown here over the course. So here we start with P0, then go to P plus, and we do this spontaneous recovery paradigm. Total learning is shown here in Salmon. The explicit part does something interesting in non It increases and then slowly decreases away, whereas the implicit component slowly increases up. And if you remember the dual rate model, these curves are very similar to the dual rate. So people have been arguing for the last few years, this is the fast process of learning. A fast process of learning is explicit the slow process is implicit. And that's sort of just an arbitrary assignment to an arbitrary model, which we, we think is wrong. So we can think about how to model this in the coin model. We have to add one more parameter in. And so we add in a parameter. And the reason is in this experiment, unlike dynamic learning, there's a discrepancy between where you see your hand, the cursor, and where your hand really is. So a natural thing is to add in a bias into our sense feedback. So now feedback is the state of the current context plus a bias parameter for that context, um, plus 
um, some noise. Okay. And in general, you know, as you go around the world, you don't experience bias between your hand and where you see it and where you feel it. So we're going to assume that the bias is implicit. You don't know about the bias. Once you learn a bias, you're not aware of it, but we're going to assume that the state of the perturbation is known. So we've got a credit assignment problem now. When you get an error, you have to assign it either to your bias or to perturbation. And as I said, we're going to assume the explicit has access to the belief about the rotation, but not to the sensory bias. So we can run this paradigm now with our bias. Again, we're not fitting. We take all the parameters from our previous fits to our spontaneous boat recovery, and we just modulate the bias parameter to get a reasonable fit to the data, just one parameter. So this shows what happens in the bias. Effectively, the bias for the first parameter is zero. When you learn the positive rotation, you learn a positive bias. When you learn the negative rotation, you get a negative bias. And therefore, here is the overall bias you learn. And as you can see that if I put this up here, it has a rather nice profile, which matches reasonably well the implicit learning. But sadly, when we look at this, our belief about state, which is shown here, um, which we thought might be the explicit, it doesn't show this nice non-monotonic feature. It shows this monotonic behavior, which is rather disappointing. But if we look at the individual states of the context from which we get this from averaging with our predicted probability, we can see that actually we start off with a, a zero state. The first state which is most probable is, is for this positive perturbation, does this non-monotonic thing. And then similarly, the context for the negative does this interesting dip thing. And I'm showing you down here, which is the most probable context each time. So I put a black line through the context which is most probable and put that up here. It shows a rather nice similarity to the explicit. So that wasn't our hypothesis. Perhaps when you make an explicit judgment, you can't get your average belief out. All you can report is the belief about your most probable context. Okay, so that's our hypothesis. And then having made a commitment about the most probable context, that's what you're going to do. And you have to sum those two to get your total output. So it would suggest, if this is true, that this total output is not the output you would generate if we didn't ask for that explicit judgment. Okay, having made an explicit judgment, as Simon Celli showed in a nice paper, it biases you to follow through on that judgment. If you don't make the explicit judgment, you should produce this motor output, which is the correct one, which is shown here in red. And in fact, they did a controlled experiment in their original experiment where they got people to do the same experiment without an explicit judgment. Of course, they wanted to say it wasn't different because they wanted to claim that making the judgment wouldn't affect what you do. But you can see qualitatively that it wasn't significant. It undershot here, undershot here, as is predicted by our model. I don't have time to go through all this, but we've compared our model to a bunch of single context and multiple context models on all the things I've shown you today. So we can do it. All the other models fail in different ways. And, and I can just try to summarize what were the failure of the other models. There were failures either in the generative process or in the inference process. So some models which don't model state dynamics can't explain things like evoked and spontaneous recovery. Models which don't have contact transitions fail. Some models don't have sensory cues, so clearly they can't deal with a memory updating, or they're non-hierarchical, or they assume the number of contexts are known. And other models, for example, when it comes to inference, only update or express a single memory, so they're non-Bayesian, they're heuristic, or learn no or few parameters. So we think the COIN model, um, in general, um, does a good job. It does it in a principled Bayesian way. It's comprehensive and that uses sort of all sources of information. It can unify these disparate data sets, which has been exciting. And we would hope that it isn't just relevant to motor control, although I think motor control provides a very rich source of data for this sort of model compared to um, more cognitive models. But we think it has relevance to the motor system beyond. And I'd like to thank all my collaborators on this and my funders. Thank you very much. Yay. Thank you. Thank you. We clapped. We clapped. So I actually, I have to run in a minute, but I'm just going to yeah. stick my oar in the water first. Okay. Um, so one of the things that I keep thinking when I, hearing you talk about this is great. Um, a lot of people are trying to do some sort of motor skill learning in reinforcement learning currently, yep. typically by trying to learn it all at once, right? Yep. So they say, oh, I have some set of low level behaviors and I have a high level thing that's going to switch between them. And I kind of just make a contraption and then I train it all simultaneously. And I think what seems maybe importantly different about the view that you have is that it's more switching oriented right. and more sequential. So I mean, right. can you 
comment on that a little bit? Sure. I th so I think, you know, I think we're, we're not trying to look at it as learning one skill. We're trying to look at, you know, the issue of how do you put multiple. And I must admit, you know, at the moment, this is very simple. It's one scalar thing we're effectively learning. So um, it suggests to us that the sequence in which you experience things may dramatically the, alter the representation with which you learn them uh, and bringing things in, in different ways. But, but I think the interesting, I, I don't have an answer to the reinforcement. I would love to have a reinforcement learning version of this. Um, which would be something for the future. This is a pure adaptation, supervised version, effectively, at the moment. Um, so I don't have a good answer to your question. Ouch. What if yeah. also yeah. The, the, these skills, these whatever procedure yeah. things you're learning, they don't compose in some way. It's not that I'm going right. to use them now yeah. to do yeah. a job, right? Is that something yeah. that you think about? So, yeah. so, so the moment where the, the simplest model here is that you have one context active at a time and only one. And so there's no concept, for example, of activating multiple contexts, which we think you know people can do. So we know, for example, that if you hold a robot and let go of the robot, that you partially unlearn it. So you basically separate out what's me and what's the robot, for example. So I think that's a, a, a next step. Um, we've thought a little bit about offline effects. So this is an online learning. One thing I think is interesting is that at the moment this generates new memories, but it's got no way to prune or merge memories. And so we'd like to think that maybe offline, maybe through sleep or other things, you may reorganize your set of memories in interesting ways. So there's a lot of work now on replay in sort of motor control, the idea that through sleep you somehow replay the actions you've done or the motions, and that could be involved in then reorganizing these memories in interesting ways. And of course, there are interesting things about consolidation and motor control, where sleep changes the representations. I see. Cool. Thanks. Yeah, thanks. I have a question about sure. the first part of the talk, uh, where kind of towards the end of the first part, you mentioned the importance of uh, planning uh, towards yep. the increasing performance. Uh, I've heard, but kind of maybe this is kind of upside that uh, thinking about just thinking without performing and actually yep. you think about it uh, in your mind kind of can improve uh, performance. Is this yep. somehow first true and to related? So, so, so we did an experiment, right? We didn't talk, talk about sort of in the follow through. We did the a follow through with just mental imagery. Okay, so we asked people to, we had a, a group who really followed through or, or group who planned to follow through and another group who didn't plan. We just said, we want you to make the movement and just imagine moving to the next thing. Okay, and they learned really well. Okay, so just imagining you're going to follow through without knowing you're never going to do it was, was actually just as good. Interestingly, it didn't generalize well then to actually following through. Okay, so if we ask them to learn by imagining follow through, and then they actually have to make the follow through movement, they had they basically got a decrement in that learning, suggesting there's something different about mentally imaging and actually planning the movement, which which was interesting to us. So I think planning can have a big effect on your ability to step out on memory, you know, mental imagery. Yeah, that's published a, a few years ago. What about if they had to imagine kind of? both the first sequence with uh, the feedback and uh, and then the follow through would it make sense to to uh, imagine that? That so, so they don't even experience the force field they need yeah, they exactly. need to experience i don't i think i think they, you, you don't expect this i, I don't think people can imagine learning a force field they never experienced <laughs> that, that seems, oh, that no, seems no, no. hard I mean, I mean if you first have some some experience about the force field okay you think it's about oh i see it's not clear. I mean, I mean, there's, there's some papers showing, for example, that just observing someone else do the experiment allows you to learn something about it. Um, so it could be, I mean, we, we didn't really want to get into the, into the mental simulation. That, you know, people claim that mental simulation helps. And it's true that just observing someone can help you learn these force fields, um, which doesn't seem very surprising to me. It's a cognitive thing. You see them get pushed off to the left and then you, get, you, know, you realize the force, which way the force is pushing. So it does help a bit. Um, we haven't tried that though. I, yeah. Are there any other questions? Okay. Have one. Oh, yeah, yeah, go ahead. No, that was me talking. Oh, <laughs> I'm not going to ask myself. <laughs> yeah, we're, 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 we're way past the hour, so. Uh, okay, no problem. Actually... Okay, thanks very much. Okay. How do you know the number of contexts that you need to learn? I'm not sure the speaker is here anymore though.
Sorry. 